Hi, I'm Charlene Jorgensen and welcome to the 900 series of Quilting from the Heartland. We've had a lot of fun getting ready for this series. My daughter Angie and her daughter Brittany, who have both been with us before, have lots of neat things to share with us. Because we are three generations taping together, you should find something for everyone in this series. I'm going to start out the top of the series with a double wedding ring. This particular double wedding ring was done with a collection of fabric by Bannertex. It is a country French collection. You'll notice that it has the light arcs on the dark background. We also selected high contrasting colors for the corners, which separates each of the circles very nicely. And you'll also notice that the same fabric is in a different position of every arc, and so we call it a scrap double wedding ring. The background has been quilted with a teardrop design, which has four hearts in it. Actually, it's a continuous line uh, quilting design, which is appropriate for both hand or machine quilting. This one was hand quilted with a gold thread so that it shows up very nicely. We have done a lot of experimenting with the double wedding ring, and the next one that I'm going to show you is one that Angie has done. It has dark circles on a light background. She has also carefully chosen high contrasting colors for the corners. The uh, double wedding ring that she has made has a totally different mood because, she, of course, she's used a different collection of fabric. The background has been quilted with a continuous line heart design, which I'll show you a little bit later. We've also done the same design in a miniature double wedding ring. This one is done with plaids and stripes. And when I work with plaids and stripes, I'm not concerned about the straight of grain of fabric. I just let it be slightly off grain and it looks just beautiful in a double wedding ring. Also, uh, with this one, we have used, again, high contrasting colors in the corners. And when you do miniature double wedding rings or any miniature quilt, you want to make sure that you use small scale prints for them because the large scale prints wouldn't show up as nicely. But today we're going to work with the larger version of the double wedding ring. Before I start cutting, I'm going to point out the different shapes that are going to be used in the double wedding ring. And off to the right, you'll see some of the different shapes that we'll be working with. First of all, we have the background piece. And you'll notice when I place it up on top of the fabric that it is transparent. And sometimes we like to use floral backgrounds. And so you could fussy cut the background if you wanted to, because it is transparent. This is the background. And you'll notice that it's a little bigger than the circle below. That's because it has the quarter inch seam allowance included in the template. Then we have the melon, which, sit, which sits down in here. We also have a connecting corner, which is used out in this part of the design. And then we have the little pieces that go into the arc of the double wedding ring. Then we have three more templates up in here. And this is the one that we're going to use today to cut the scrap double wedding ring. And notice that when I place it up on top of the pieces. It's a lot longer than this arc, and I will be showing you how to put that together. Then we have a shorter one, which could be used if you wanted to use just one piece of fabric in the double wedding ring, which would be called a seamless arc. We'll also show you that quilt a little bit later on. Then the last one which comes in the set is used in a plan version, which we won't be able to show you today. But that would be something that you would want to tune in for uh, to another program to watch. So you see you have many different options when cutting out the double wedding ring. Ahead of time, I have pre-cut some strips of fabric. Actually, we have six layers on top of each other. And these will be the six pieces that will be used in the arc of the double wedding ring. We have put. Uh, fabric grips on the back side of the templates, and that keeps them from sliding when I cut with the rotary cutter. So we'll lay the template up on top of the pre-cut strips of fabric. 
And it's important to allow plenty of room to turn your board as you're cutting around the template. So we'll move it this way so that it's easy to get at. And I like to use the small rotary cutter to do all of my cutting, especially when you're working with curves, because the large cutter will not follow the curve as well. The first cut I make, I always go backwards and then forward and just follow the edge of the template. And like I said, make sure you allow plenty of room so that you can turn the board as you cut around the template. And we'll just scoot that out of the way. Now after you have cut the master arc or the first one, never disturb that piece of fabric or those pieces because then you would lose some of the accuracy. So the next thing that you would do is go and cut it into the little pieces that go into the arc. Remember when I showed you in the beginning, this was the uh, all the pieces show, sewn together. So that's what we're going to do now is cut from the six different fabrics all the pieces that go into an arc. When we are done with this step, we will have 36 pieces cut or enough for six arcs of the double wedding ring. Now this would have taken Grandma a lot longer to do because she would have used um, a cardboard pattern possibly and she would have traced around it and then cut it out with a scissor. I have just now completed cutting 36 pieces. Then after you have done that, I would take the time to put it up on a flannel board and I always work from a flannel board no matter what the design is. And I will first place the end piece down, all six of them. And because it's a scrap design, I don't want to use the same piece of fabric in the arc. So we'll go like this and continue on until you have used all of the pieces. And you would do that with all of the pieces that you have cut. Notice how I'm trying to avoid using that same piece every time. And there are six pieces in every arc. So we would, well, that one goes down there. See how nice it is to work from a flannel board? Whoops. We maybe have one or two of them duplicated, but you get the idea of how I work um, with all of the pieces until you have all six pieces together. Now I've used that one already, so we'll go like that. Then you stand back and look at it, and if you like it, then you're ready to sew those arcs together. The other pieces that we have to cut are the background pieces and the connecting corners. To cut the background piece, I will fold my fabric into four equal parts, first matching the selvage edges, and then fold it again, and we'll leave it so that we don't, we don't want to use that selvage edge in the quilt. And then lay the background piece up on top of there and allow plenty of room to get the melon out of all four sides. We have to bump it down just a little bit there. And the last one we'll have to unfold to get uh, use of that fabric. Again, we'll turn it so that we have plenty of room to work. And just follow the edge of the pattern shape until you've gone all the way around.
so often when I'm working in the studio at home, I end up getting so much clutter on the cutting board that it's impossible to turn. But you can see why it is important to allow plenty of room to turn as you cut around the template. Otherwise, you'd be cutting backhanded. Then make sure that you close your blade before you're done with that. And that's how you cut the background piece. And I have just cut four of those. And then to cut the melons that go into the design, I'll move the small pieces up onto the smaller cutting board. And again, because we're working on a smaller board, it's not as much to turn. And we'll be getting four of these at one time. Now we have the melons cut, and I won't cut the rest of them, but none of these pieces will be wasted because I can unfold that one and we can lay this one on top and we would actually get six of those at a time. So you see there's very little waste when doing it this way. The last thing that I'm going to show you how to cut is the connecting corners. And ahead of time I have pre-cut some strips to show you how I do it. Now we have two colors uh, for the connecting corners. They're of high contrasting colors. And there are two ways that you can cut the connecting corner. You can cut them on the straight of grain like this or on the bias like this. And I prefer doing it like this because it's a little bit easier to put into the quilt. And let's move it up onto a small board again. We'll be getting four of these at one time. Turn the board. Each time working your way around the template. And that's how you would cut then the connecting corners. It's a little more wasteful cutting it on the bias, but like I mentioned earlier, it's a little bit easier to put into the quilt when you do it that way, so the little bit of waste uh, isn't that bad. Well, I think we're ready to go to the sewing machine now and start putting the double wedding ring together. Ahead of time, I have put some steps up on the flannel board, so it'll make it easier for me to walk you through the process. And I think we'll start out by looking at the steps of construction before I actually start to sew. In the beginning, you'll start sewing, uh, first of all, all the seams with a scant quarter inch seam allowance. And I stress that in every program because it is so important to do you need to make up for the amount of fabric used in the seam line. You'll start out by sewing the four center pieces of the arc together first, and then after you have done that, we will put the end pieces on. After you have put those together, you need to take a sewing test, and those six pieces sewn together must equal the seamless arc template, and if it doesn't, you need to go back and readjust your seam allowance so that it does fit. After you have done that, you'll be ready to go on and chain sew, which is a lot faster than just sewing uh, one arc at a time. After you have made this arc, then you're ready to put the melon on. And down here, we have already done that. And on the other part, we have already put the connecting corners on. And then this will be the seam that we do next. And I'm going to take time to show you how to pin that. And then we have a completed melon after that. So let's go back now and show you. We'll go back to where we have already passed the sewing test. And we'll continue on from that point. So I'll take these two pieces off the flannel board first. We have the uh, sewing machine set for a scant quarter inch seam allowance. And I'm going to use cotton thread uh, to do all my sewing. Now I have already passed my sewing test. And I forgot to mention that I press all of the seams in this design in one direction. And that has already been done as well. To find the center 
of the melon. I folded it in half and I cut a little notch on both sides. That way I know where the center point is. And now I will lay the arc up on top of there and we'll start pinning it together. I recommend that you use silk pins uh, for all quilting. We'll first put a pin in the center and now when you do the next pin you'll have a little bit of a tail on the end and this seam will start right in this crevice right here. And when we put another pin in here you'll notice that I don't have to stretch anything or ease anything. We will not clip any curves. If you have to do one or the other, then your seam allowance was inaccurate in the beginning. So if your pieces fit nicely, that means you pass the sewing test. But I do stress that over and over that you need to make sure that you use that scant quarter inch seam allowance. OK, we will start sewing, like I said, in the crevice right here, which is um, where the two intersections come together there. Make sure you pull the pins before you get to them. And I will guide the fabric with the stiletto when I do uh, this seam. And because we have pressed all the seams in this direction, I don't have to worry about them uh, flipping backwards. And I also forgot to mention that we sew with the arc on top when doing this seam. When you use the stiletto, you don't have to use quite as many pins when you're sewing a seam. Half of my pinning is done with, with the stiletto as I sew. And try to avoid sewing over any pins. There will be one point where we'll have to, but do avoid it if you can. Now this seam will end right in the crevice. I don't do any back stitching uh, for the most part. Now when this seam is finished, we will finger press the seam allowance towards the background. See how nice that lays? There are no gathers or ripples in the design. If it does ripple, that means that your seam allowance was off. The next part that we do is attach the connecting corners on. And I'd, I'd like to show that next because there is a little trick to that. We're going to put a different color on each end. We'll move it around like this. I'm not going to use any pins when I put the connecting corner on, but I'm going to lay it up on top and I'm going to adjust the fabric as I sew. And we'll move it down just a little bit. See there's a little bit of tail showing on this side. That's about the amount that you want to allow for the seam allowance. And I think I'm going to start on an anchor cloth before I do this seam. An anchor cloth is something that I've started to use a lot and it's just easier uh, to start that seam. Okay, now I'll just scoot it up there with the stiletto holding it in place. I'll sew a few seam or stitches, then I'll adjust it and hold it with the stiletto. See how easy that is? It's a nice gentle curve. And I haven't had to take all that time to put all those pins in. We have one nice connecting corner on. 
Something else too that I should mention is notice that there is a curve on the connecting corner. So you want to make sure that you put this curve to match this curve. Once in a while people will get it turned like that and it doesn't end up looking very good. So you have to make sure that you put the two curves together. I won't put the other one on because that would take too much time, but now we'll go on to the next step and we will attach the two parts of the melon. This one has the connecting corners already and this one has the melon on it. This is probably the most difficult part for all people to do when making the double wedding ring and I'll try to be very careful uh, in showing you what to do. Now we're going to match this curve to the one that's below and we're going to match the center notch on the melon with the center seam and we'll insert a pin right there. The next part is to put a pin right on the seam line a fourth of an inch from the edge through the top and the bottom And then we'll hold that pin in place and put a pin, actually we could do it a couple of different ways. We're going to just flip this pin back and that's the point that we're going to sew over. We'll put another one over here and then one in the center. To repeat that because it is so important I'm going to put a pin right on the seam line through the top and through the bottom. And where you put the pin is in is important, not where it comes out. So we'll flip that one back, put another pin on this end, and another one down here. Now in one continuous seam, we would sew from this end to this end, but making sure that you sew directly over the point that this pin goes into the fabric. So this time it will be necessary to sew over the pin, but slow down when you get there. Then you will have a melon that looks like this. And see how nice and flat that lays? You will press the seam allowance towards the background. Then after you have done that, you start building your circle. Now you will have the background to attach to the melon and that's already been done at this point. And when you do this part, you sew with the background on top. And this is the first time that we're going to back stitch when doing this design. You'll back to one fourth of an inch from the end of the tail of the tail back that we have not sewn past that seam allowance. Then you'll sew to the other, do the same thing, back stitch at that seam line and press the seam allowance towards the arc of the uh, melon. Then to uh, build the circle, rather you keep adding the melons to the circle and notice how we have alternated the colors. Now the size of this quilt of course is determined by the number of circles that go into the double wedding ring. And here we have a double wedding ring that's a little bit farther along. And see how we have now got a row ready to attach to the other part of the wedding ring. Also, I should mention that we haven't sewn the connecting corners yet. That is the very last thing that you do when you do the double wedding ring. After you have your top completely pieced, you're ready to start putting the quilting design on top of it. And the continuous line design that I talked about earlier looks like this. And what you do is you center it over the top of each of the circles and mark between each of the bridges of the stencil with a fabric marking pencil. Then you are ready to make your quilt sandwich by putting your batting in the center and the back of the quilt together and then it is ready to either machine or hand quilt. I hope you've enjoyed watching my favorite quilt go together today and join us next